I'll be talking about uh, visible and invisible beings as well. Um, only two, uh, or possibly three, uh, real animals appear in Shakespeare's plays or are required to do so. Um, but his life world, his language, is full of animals. Animals, as the anthropologist uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, put it, are good to think with. But in the Renaissance, um, they're also good to, as it were, feel with. They're used as ways of uh, mediating and attempting to understand the complexity of human emotions and relationships. But we need to understand a little bit about how the Renaissance viewed animals, which I think is very different from the way that the modern world understands animals. We see here in uh, Tintoretto's great early painting, The Creation of the Animals, a picture of the world before humans are created. That world is fundamentally orderly. Everything, as you can see, including God himself, is pointing in the same direction. And you'll notice here, at the end of the uh, screen, the end of the painting, we also have a unicorn included in that. Uh, everything has a sense of common purpose. Now, the Renaissance conception of humanity's place in the world was that man was a kind of unnecessary add-on, a supplement to creation, um, but, uh, and therefore didn't fit into this orderly world. He was a supplement, but he was also, in a sense, a summing up of the divine <coughs> creation. Um, a man is considered uh, as something that can, that, that can observe the world, that can look upon the world with wonder. In The Tempest, that sense of wonder is again uh, mediated by the idea of uh, the appearance of unicorns. Now I will believe that there are unicorns. Unicorns are figures of wonder. Of course, they famously missed the boat, uh, supposedly, uh, in the ark. Um, and also the mythological bird, the phoenix. There's this fascination with the uniqueness of certain kinds of mythological animals uh, in Shakespeare's world. But man was not only an epitome of God's creation in the Renaissance conception, but man was also deeply embedded in animal creation. Man was thought to share souls with other animals. So unlike the post-Cartesian, the post-17th century conception of man's relationship to animals, in which man is fundamentally separate from animal creation, the Renaissance conception uh, has man um, deeply connected to animals. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin, uh, says Ulysses in uh, Troilus and Cressida. And that sense of kinship with the animals is deeply um, embedded in all of Shakespeare's language and helps us to understand some of the motives of his characters. Animals are often used to think about things which might otherwise seem motiveless. Shylock, attempting to explain his antipathy for the titular merchant of Venice, uh, Antonio, says, some men there are that love not a gaping, there are love not a gaping pig, some that are mad if they behold a cat, and others, when the bagpipe sings in the nose, cannot contain their urine, for affection, mistress of passion, sways it to the mood. Um, the mood of human beings is like that, is like the whole system of sympathies and antipathies within the natural world. The harmless necessary cat, which some are just naturally repelled by, um, is also, it helps to explain a natural repulsion that Shylock feels for Antonio. Some motives cannot be accounted for rationally then, but are part of our animal nature. This helps to channel and funnel unconscious motivations then. But there's also a sense within uh, Renaissance conceptions of things that uh, humans could become animals and animals could become humans. There was a greater continuity between animals and humans than there is in the modern world. And this painting, which you can see uh, in a rather better version in the Ashmolean, in fact, has one of the animals escaping from the fire, the fire which is probably caused by human art. Um, one of the animals has acquired a human face. Uh, 
go and look at that in the Ashmolean. The reproduction here is not brilliant. But here we see in this painting the idea of human art that has caused this fire, but also the idea of human care and stewardship, human duties to animals that are a fundamental requirement of our understanding of man's place in the world in Shakespeare. Animals are also used to explain the existence of really anomalous figures, like the monstrous tyrant Richard III, uh, about whom there is perhaps the richest vein of animal imagery in all of Shakespeare's plays. Um, drawing on his heraldic emblem, um, the emblem of the hog, he is turned into the wretched, bloody, and usurping boar. He's turned into something like the beast of revelation that spoils the summer fields and ruined vines, etc., etc. Even now he is in the center of the aisle, this terrible, frightening beast is even now in the center of the aisle, near to the town of Leicester, as we hear. The other feature of um, the Renaissance conception of animals was the idea that man was somehow the epitome, the abridgment of the whole of animal creation. But that wasn't necessarily presented as a positive thing. In Troilus and Cressida, the lumpen sort of anti-hero, Ajax, um, is presented as someone who has all of the bad features of nature. He's as valiant as the lion, but churlish as the bear, slow as the elephant a man into, nature, into whom nature hath so crowded humours that his valour is crushed into folly, his folly sourced with, uh, with discretion. This is a man who is not a positive vision of, anim of, animals, uh, of man summing up all of the animals, but a negative vision. And that sense that man could become animal was a way of explaining that which was fundamentally unaccountable. In addition to this, though, man's connection to the animal world in the Renaissance could also be conceived as a way of undoing man's supposedly but precariously privileged position within the order of things. In Henry VI, part two, Jack Cade, the rebel against the king, um, laments that he has been undone by uh, various products of the animal world. Is this not a lamentable thing, that of the skin of an innocent lamb should be made parchment, that parchment, being scribbled o'er, should undo a man? Some say the bee stings, but I say tis the bee's wax, for I did but seal once to a thing, and I was never mine own man since. The idea of self-possession um, the idea that an individual has complete control over their own lives, the idea of human autonomy, is fundamentally compromised through the agency of the law. Famously, of course, Jack Cade says that he wants to kill all the lawyers. But his lament is mediated through the, um, the products of animals uh, in such a context. Now, I also want to turn to the fact that animals were increasingly a presence in Shakespeare's London. Here we see uh, Shakespeare's early patron, uh, the uh, Earl of Southampton. Um, now, I want to add that this is not a particularly serious point. Uh, I've uh, occasionally worried about getting into trouble uh, in lectures making this point. The, the young man here is a possible candidate for being the young man addressed in Shakespeare's sonnets. But there's been a great mystery, famously, as to the identity of the dark lady. Uh, now, the dark lady, uh, who appears in the final sequence of the sonnets, uh, is a mysterious uh, figure whose eyes are nothing like the sun. Rather unusually, though, when imprisoned in the Tower of London, the Earl of Southampton saw, saw it fit to uh, have himself portrayed. Um, he annoyed Queen Elizabeth by being involved in a rebellion and got sent to the Tower, and he's portrayed with his cat. Now, this cat, whose name apparently it was Trixie, or so the myth goes, um, stands there with her eyes nothing like the sun. So I'd like to offer a conjecture that perhaps Shakespeare 
drew upon this rather bad-tempered-looking little cat as a possible third in the love triangle with the Earl of Southampton. Finally, though, I want to think about what animals do in the theatre. I mentioned that there are three animals in Shakespeare's plays, two certainly. Um, there's possibly a mouse who appears in, the, uh, in King Lear. King Lear says that he's going to give a piece of toasted cheese to, um, uh, to a mouse. Um, there's definitely a dog called Crab who turns up in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. But perhaps most famously, Shakespeare presents a bear on the stage in The Winter's Tale. <coughs> the character Antigonus, in perhaps the most famous of all stage directions, exits and is eaten by a bear. Why a bear? Well, bears were in distinct proximity to Shakespeare's theatre. One of the theatres just down the road from uh, Shakespeare's own theatre was occasionally used as a bear garden, and bear baiting was one of the great entertainments of the time. Bears introduced an element of savagery into the midst of this burgeoning commercial city. They introduced a figure of cruelty and savagery. And I want to end by exiting pursued, not by a savage bear, but by the MCR <laughs> bear, <laughs> who will menace me off the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.